you would, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Are we live? Thank you, Emily. We welcome you if you're joining us through Facebook Live and we just went over the prayer list and we have many to pray for. We continue to remember our church and prayers, our members, our congregation, those who are sick and are not able to be here tonight. We also have other prayer requests that we have and uh, just continue to remember that God wants us to pray. And so we pray, and what a privilege and an honor it is that we can pray. But we're going to continue a series. I know it's been kind of every other week or so, and so sometimes when we get started in, uh, we have to do a little recap uh, just to kind of catch us up so we can hit our feet running. Uh, in Romans chapter 10, we've been doing the series for a while, and really uh, our verses are going to be 12 through 21. And there are going to be that many uh, number of verses because it's pretty much saying the same thing. Uh, Paul is saying here in verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So really, this last lesson that we looked at, it ended in verse 11, because it said, The Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, shall not be ashamed. What we're looking at here is the universal preaching of the gospel that had been already predicted in the Old Testament. And we see in this, the rest of this chapter, Israel's guilt, the national Israel for rejecting the Messiah. Not only did they reject Christ as Messiah, but they also did not recognize that they were fulfilling the prophecy that God would extend his mercy to the Gentiles. And that had been prophesied. And we're going to see that even Moses prophesied it and Isaiah prophesied it. So not only did they miss Christ being Messiah and they rejected him, um, we, if you actually go up to verse 2 in chapter 10, here's one of the big reasons that they also rejected Christ. Paul says of his brethren according to the flesh in verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant, which, what does ignorant mean? It means a lack of knowledge. They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In order to do submission, in order to fully receive uh, Christ as Savior by faith alone and Christ alone, you must submit to the fact that you can offer nothing to God. There's no righteousness of yourself. There's no piety. There's no ritual. There's no uh, any kind of outward uh, religion or piety that you can bring to God that would be pleasing to him. But what do we do? In faith, we submit to his righteousness because his righteousness is saving righteousness. It is God's righteousness which he offers. Now, what is the righteousness of God? Well, righteousness of God is Jesus had fulfilled all the law. Jesus went to the cross, and there he died, and there he was punished by God for the wrath that God was poured upon Christ, even though Christ was perfect. The wrath of God was poured upon him as the sacrificial lamb. So instead of me being punished, Christ was punished. So you've got to come to terms when you start to understand that's how God's righteousness is imputed to us. It's not so much that God infuses us with this uh, remarkable ability to never sin again. That's not true. You know, uh, it's this... What God has done is provided his son's righteousness in my account. So instead of uh, when he sees, uh, when he opens up the book and he, and he looks at my account, he sees that all those sins have been paid for. 
It's just as if I had never sinned. I'm justified. Because Christ's goodness, his ability to keep the law, his perfectness was charged to my account. So what about my sins, though? Doesn't God still have to punish sins? Is God just going to ignore my sins? No, what happened? My sins were charged to Christ's account. So when God sees Christ's account, he sees Philip's unpaid sins. What happened at the cross? That's where Christ paid for all my sins. And that's why they're yesterday, today, and tomorrow's, right? So they're all my sins. Jesus paid it all. So it's not just my sins that was in Christ's account. If you're saved today, it was your sins. It was your particular sins. Not your, you know, not just being a sinner, but all of your particular ways that you sin. Now, when we come to Christ believing he's our Savior, we have to humbly come to him. And so that means that there's nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I cling. That was where the Jews stumbled. The Jews were self-righteous. They had... They had this tradition. They had this name. They had this family. They come from Abraham, the stock of Abraham. Um, They had a zeal towards God. You know, they did everything in the name of religion, everything in the name of God. They were delivered the law on Mount Sinai. Moses was their father. Abraham was their father. They have a pride of race and religion. Have you ever seen a Jew's door knocking? You go to the Jews. The Jews don't go to you. The Jews don't go out. There are no missionary Jews. The Jews are so proudful. They're like, if you want to join our group, we don't blame you. But we're not coming to beg you. And we're going to see that flip here when we start seeing the gospel. Because Jesus sent his church to go out and proclaim the good news to all nations and all lands. So we're going to see that. The Jews missed. But, you know, we know this was written specifically, you know, to the Jews, but it was written for our admonishment, for our uh, education, for us to see. There's things that still apply to us. Uh, You know, when it comes to any religion of works, we could see kind of the same similarities between what the Jews were trusting in instead of Christ and Christ alone. We see a lot of that in religion today. They'll trust in something. They may trust in Christ for some of it, but they'll trust in something else like baptism or church membership or a pope or something or John Smith's book or this whatever. They'll do grace plus works somehow. And so that's what we see, and basically it comes down to that, that They, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, have not submitted themselves unto God's righteousness, but was trying to what? Establish their own. So here we see that the gospel is to be declared universally. Paul has, again, been bringing this point up over and over, and he really comes down here at the end of of chapter 10, and he's really honing down. And he's deliberately talking to his kinsmen according to the flesh. I mean, he's really talking to the physical nation here. In verse 12, he says, For there is no difference. And he's referring to verse 11, Whosoever believeth on him, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So there's going to be a, a couple of things that we're going to look at. In verses 12 through 13, we see the gospel declared is to be universal. In verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this statement is true. The gospel is to be declared universally. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, no difference. Um, first of all, we know this is true because of God's character. In verse 12, it says, The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He is the same Lord over all. He's the same creator over everyone. Uh, In 1 Timothy 4.10, you don't have to turn there. We will be going to a different couple places, uh, hopefully tonight. But in 1 Timothy 4.10, 
It says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, specifically of those that believe. Actually, why don't you just keep your finger here real quick. I, I did want to expound on this verse a little bit. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, if you wouldn't mind turning there. This is a, uh, this is a good verse to meditate on. I just love when you know, the Lord opens up a verse and there's a lot of drilling, right? You can, you can just keep drilling in these verses. But in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, verse 10, we'll read it here. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, specifically of those that believe. Now what does that mean? We know that not everybody's saved. Not all men are saved. So what does it mean when it says that he is the Savior of all men? Because he is. He's the only Savior. There is no other Savior. If you reject Christ as your Savior, as your way to go to heaven, or your uh, way to be saved, there's no other Savior. So he's the only Savior given to men, right? But he's specifically (laughs) our Savior who believes. And those who believe upon him, he is our Savior. He will save us from wrath to come. And I thought that was a beautiful verse because at first it may look confusing, but the more you look at it, it's not. Because there is no other Savior, and those who believe, he is effectively our Savior. But if you go back to Romans chapter 10, we're talking about uh, God's character. It says that he is rich in mercy. Over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So he's talking about of all the nations, of all the people, Jew or Greek, doesn't matter. Um, I like a couple of the verses that we can refer to. I'll, I'll just read them. Psalm 86, 5. It says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Notice how many times, and we're going to not talk about this right now, but in the back of your mind, let's just start registering how many times you see the word call. Uh, it says in verse um, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 12, it said, For there is no difference between the Jew and Greek, for the Lord over all is rich unto all that what call upon him. And we see that his character is he is rich in mercy, that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. In Ephesians 2, 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. Now we see in verse 13, verse 12 and 13, there's no difference. And he has been arguing this point, and especially in the beginning of Romans, chapter 1 through 3, that there is no difference. There's in the need of righteousness, between Jew and Gentile. There is no difference. And the fact that we've all failed to achieve the righteousness of the law, there's no difference in God providing this righteousness in Christ for all who believe. Uh, Again, this no difference has been a major, major theme through all of Romans up to this point. And if you go back and you start thinking about the chapters, like in high-level view, outline view, that you're going to see this theme bounce around. Of course, it's been justification by faith, alone, without works. We see that. But we also see that the Jews, and, we, and when we were doing our Acts study, remember how furious the Jews would get that they, the Gentiles were even being preached the gospel. They hated the Gentiles. They wouldn't step foot in a Gentile country. I mean, they despise them. And here you are preaching unto the Gentiles. 
So not only uh, were they rejecting Christ as king, but they were rejecting the Gentiles of having any favor of God. And so that's where Paul's coming in, is not only are you not understanding the submission of faith and the humility and how our works are not involved with salvation, but you're also not seeing that God clearly in the prophets had shown that he will provoke you unto jealousy by calling them which had not called on him before, that he would call the Gentiles. So, I mean, you can imagine Paul who loves his brethren according to the flesh. He loves national Israel. This is kind of like his, his plead letter to them. Please understand, you are fulfilling the role in Acts. You remember his sermon. And we can turn there uh, after a while, but in Acts chapter 13, he was saying that you know, the, the, the prophets had prophesied that even though a man come and declare Christ unto you, that you would reject it. And today you are fulfilling that very promise from the prophets. Don't you see what's going on? And they couldn't see. They couldn't see. God had not opened their eyes. They were blinded. They could not see. They were rejecting Christ. But here, we also know in verse 13 that God's promises are true. God's promises are true. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the word name here, whoever calls upon the name, it signifies the Lord himself. Not just his name, but it means him. Um, like the publican and the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, uh, the publican had called, asked, begged that he'd be merciful unto him a sinner. And you remember Jesus said that he walked away justified, that he called upon Christ to be merciful to him. The one who calls upon the Lord, if you are the one in verse 13 that has called upon the name of the Lord, you are someone who has humbled yourself before God, you recognize his power, you adore his majesty, excuse me, you believe his promises. You hope in his mercy. You honor him as your God. You love him as your Savior. In John 1.12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, believing on his name, calling on his name, there's context underneath there, right? It is about believing upon him. When you call upon him, when you believe upon him, when you come to him as the, or as the publican came to him, begging for mercy, you're calling upon him to save you. You're reaching to him, you're calling him to save you. That is the action that it's talking about, that, that, that you shall call upon him. Now, uh, 14 through 15, it says, How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel is absolutely necessary to believing. In verse 14, you cannot believe if you've not heard the gospel. It says, how then, how can you call upon the name of the Lord if you've not believed? You're not going to call upon the name of the Lord if you are not believing upon him. And how can you believe him is what it's saying and how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? If you've not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, how do you know what to believe, who to believe? So you're not going to be saved. So if you work it backwards, you're not going to be saved because you've not called upon him. You've not called upon him because you've not believed him. You've not believed him because you've not heard the gospel. You've not heard the word. And verse 15, and at the end of verse 14, how shall they hear without a preacher. 
Um, and verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? That's a big one. That's a big one for us. Uh, I always um, to say this is one of the Baptist doctrines, but this is one of the truths. It's not just Baptist, it's the truth of the Bible. Preachers need to be sent, and they need to be sent by God. We believe in God-called ministers. Um, if you're not called by God, if you're not sent by God, in verse 15, you should not be preaching God. Verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? Sent by God and sent by their church. Because we see that example in Acts. Who sent the missionaries? The church of Antioch. And then the churches that the churches of Antioch started there in, in Turkey and, and everywhere, those churches had authority because they were started in authority. And then those churches would send missionaries. And that, it just multiplied. And the Lord's churches would start coming up everywhere because it kept multiplying. Um, from this passage, we see that men must not preach whom God has not sent. The Bible teaches a God-called ministry. And, you know, and I hate to, to say this because I see this, I see the sincerity uh, of people we had one person who came up to me, and they're no longer here. And um, you, you doubt, I don't know if you know them, but they said that you know I, I think I can preach. I, th I think I'd be a pretty good preacher. I was like, well, you've got to be called first to preach. You, you, there has to be a burden on your heart because those whom preach it has to be sent, has to be called. God calls us into office. God calls us unto preaching, unto teaching, um, you know, and we see the qualifications of a bishop, we see the qualifications of a deacon, we, we see the blueprint laid out, but it must be the Lord weighing something on your heart. Um, when I, I was called to preach, I didn't, I, I, I thought it was, I thought it was everything going on within me except God. <laughs> I thought it was, well, maybe I just want to do this to make dad happy, or maybe I just want to do this to make mom happy, or because, uh, you know, my brother, I'm not like my brother. My brother can talk. My brother can, you know, he can captivate. He can, aura, uh, he's got the, the oratory stick skills, and he always has, you know, and uh, so I didn't, I was like, I can't do that, and I found myself being a Moses, you know, I, Lord, I can't speak. <laughs> well, why would you send me? And and so then I'm like, well, am I being a Moses? You know, there was so much turmoil, so much unpeace until I surrendered the call to preach, and then I got peace because I was so much in question of the call. Now, until you receive that call, don't preach. Don't preach in the, the name of the Lord. Um, and here it says in verse 15, now let me say this. I, I want to clarify. We can all teach, you know, um, you can be a teacher and not a preacher, you know, uh, or a pastor. Uh, you can be a preacher and not a pastor, you know, or evangelist. Um, but certainly we can all teach. My mother wasn't called to preach, but she led me to the Lord, you know, when I was at home. And so we can all certainly, and I'm actually, hopefully I get to that. Um, so let me move on so I don't step on my own toes. And it says, how beautiful are the feet in verse if you look at the end of verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so Paul's bringing up prophecy again. Isaiah chapter 52 talks about how beautiful are the feet. Now here's something uh, that, that you might like. Feet here are mentioned and not the whole body because the feet are instruments of motion. They bring the good tidings. And as they run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And it's not the feet that are beautiful, it's the gospel that is beautiful, which we run and we use our feet. So we are in motion. In verse 16 through 17, 
Even though we have these glad tidings and we're spreading the tidings and the plan of salvation is simple and it's by the free, rich grace of God which he gives to us. In verse 16 it says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. What's obeying the gospel? You're commanded to believe it. You are commanded today to repent of your sins and believe the gospel. If you do not do that, you're disobeying a command. And so not all have obeyed. All, you know, uh, most of them, a lot of them have disobeyed. And he says in verse 16, For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Here's another proof Paul is giving that remember what the prophet said and how none of the Jews are believing? Isn't this a lot like what Isaiah said that's going on right now? <laughs> He's like, if, if, if there was any way, and even in a chapter before, he was like, I wish on myself to be a curse uh, so that my brethren, according to the flesh, may be saved. He loved. He loved the souls of people. And it burdened him. And so he's writing this in hope to say, look, even the prophets uh, had predicted the very thing you see with your eyes today. You rejected Christ, who said he was the Son of God, and now you are not believing in bulk. Look how many people are not believing. And he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And so verse 16, the gospel is deliberately refused. The fact is, most that hear the gospel today will refuse it. Just like Israel did. We know why from the Bible. Because Jesus says that men prefer darkness over than light. They preferred to be in condemnation, right? But does the Bible tell us that there will be few who are saved? In the history of time, it does. It does tell us that. And it tells us there in Isaiah 53, 1, who shall believe our report? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many, be, be, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. John chapter 1. We see another evidence from the Word of God that this condition, uh, which shouldn't surprise us, it's told to us in the Bible. It said in John chapter 1 that Jesus himself was in the world, and the world was made by him, and what happened? The world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In verse 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So I want to talk about this word hearing a little bit in verse 17. Um, I like this. Uh, Brother Berlin Heisel brings this out. He says the apostles communicated their testimony. Now, before the, before the, the New Testament was written, now remember, uh, these are letters. Now, we believe these are all inspired, that God inspired Paul to write these, but these are letters to the churches for the most part. Uh, here and there, you know, the epistles to the churches. So we, at this point, you just had the Old Testament. Right? And then you have the apostles, the ones Jesus started his earthly ministry and then had the apostles. And he says, I will leave, but a comforter shall come. And this comforter is the Holy Spirit. And he'll lead you and guide you into what? All truth. And he'll cause the apostles to remember everything that Christ taught and that he began to teach and to do. And things would start clicking. <laughs> for the apostles, because the Holy Spirit would guide them into it. That's the inspiration of the New Testament. And even Paul, who is the apostle. So we need to see here that the apostles communicated their testimony by a living voice. And if you remember in Corinthians, that they, they said there's a more sure word of prophecy coming. Up to this point, it was through the mouth. 
There was no written down New Testament yet. Everything was through their testimony, miracles, signs, and wonders in the New Testament, and through their mouth. There, there was a living uh, hearing or living voice. And then by their writings, both preaching and God's word, can comprehend, and comprehension is what is called hearing. What does it say? So then faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing is being communicated the gospel, whether it's in spoken word or it's in the written word. Now, you, we say that it's the understanding of what you've been told, what I've just told you about your condition, about Christ, about salvation about hearing it, right? So hearing the gospel simply is being communicated the, the gospel. Think about deaf people. Deaf people hear the word of God by being communicated to, whether visibly or by reading of the word of God. Faith must come not from the revelations of the works of God, but by the revelations from the word of God. Now that's good. Uh, faith, or I'm sorry, faith must come not from the revelations of the works of God, because the works of God, they declare the glory of God and that God exists, but they, they don't tell us the gospel, do they? We, we don't see the gospel in creation. Where do, we see God, where do we see the gospel revealed? We see it revealed through the word of God. Now whether that was in this time, the spoken revelation, or in our time, the written revelation of God and the word of God. And so that is why this right here, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and pretty much this whole chapter is a justification of missions. No matter what kind of thick theology that you may get into and you may be spear, uh, finding yourself spin off into Heresy, if you start seeing guardrails come up that, or any kind of teaching or writing, and they're saying, well, this is why missions aren't necessary. You need to rein that back in and throw that book away. Because the word of God clearly states to his kind of churches the go out into all the world and preach the gospel, is that we are a missionary Baptist church. Uh, and here... We see, and we see many proofs, but here's one specific proof, is that how can they hear if a preacher's not sent? And the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. And we can look, that's Deuteronomy 32, 31, but we'll keep moving. Uh, Mo Moses kind of mentions it, but Isaiah uh, puts his foot on the gas when he mentions it in verse 20. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Specifically, in conclusion, this passage is referring to the unbelieving Jews, those who call themselves God's people, but in fact were not God's people. We saw that earlier in Romans chapter, and actually earlier on in the chapter. They did not believe the gospel nor did they realize the prophets had foretold of the very condition that they were in. As we study this, and actually chapter 11 is going to have more of Israel, so chapter 9, 10, and 11, we've dealt with a lot of Israel, and physical Israel versus spiritual Israel. We need to understand what Paul's saying here, that there's no difference between Jew and Greek. We need to also understand that it's not specific it's not like there's no lesson or application for us here. We also see that any religious system that comes by works of any way, instead of by faith alone and Christ alone, is false. It's a false religion. When you do not believe in Christ and the gospel by faith alone and Christ alone, 
you have in every way rejected the gospel. Even if you've received a little bit of it, even if you're one of these religions that believe that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. Maybe you believe Jesus is a Savior sent from God or Jesus was a God or whatever they're teaching out there that's not in the Word of God. If you add works, unless you come by grace through faith in Christ and His work and His work alone and humbly you come to Him, you see yourself a sinner, deserving and headed towards hell. And you come to his feet and you pound on your breast like the uh, publican did and you ask, you call upon his name to have mercy upon you. And him alone, you trust in him alone that he will save you. That is being saved. If that's not that, you're rejecting the gospel because that's what the gospel is. And how do we know that? Because you've heard. You've heard today. You've heard the word of God. You've heard it. Um, There is no difference or exceptions in who we think we are or what we're trusting in to go to heaven. All have sinned. All need saved. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by grace.